joining us from Avalanche Studios Group, I'm pleased to welcome Cecilia Asp, who will guide us through this event. Welcome, Cecilia. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, and with that, we can begin. Hello, everyone. My name is Cecilia Asp. And like Anna said, I will be the moderator for this webinar on the evolution of gaming. Now, before we begin, let me do a quick rundown of the agenda. I will start with a quick introduction to myself, as well as to the video game industry. After that, my co-guests Anna Norvik and Linda Leto will introduce themselves. We will then transition over into a discussion on the trends and future of the video game industry, and we will wrap up with a Q&A session. But introductions. I'm a graduate of Stockholm School of Economics. I went the bachelor program in business and economy and the master program in marketing. I graduated back in 2014 and joined the company Fatshark, who are both producers and developers of console and computer games. During the course of four years, I released two very successful games and helped grow the marketing team. And in 2018, I was approached by Avalanche Studios Group to become their marketing specialist. And over the course of the last three years, I've helped grow their marketing team, released two very successful games, and I have transitioned over into my role as a product marketing manager. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what a product marketing manager does, well, uh, it is basically the bridge between the development team of a specific game and the marketing team. So I make sure that we take customer and marketing considerations into the development process. And in turn, I make sure that my marketing team is supporting a title in the best possible way. But enough introductions. Let's jump into the video game industry. Now, before we begin, and before I dump, jump a little bit into the history, I first want to ask you all a question. And this question will be available in polls. So I'm very curious to see your answers to this. And that question is, how large a percentage of the world population played video games in 2020? I won't answer this immediately. Have a think about it, and I'll come back to it later on in the presentation. So the video game industry has a very interesting relationship with public perception. Even to this day, I think a lot of people still associate video games with kids, with teenagers, and with boys. And I honestly think a lot of this has to do with the fact that the video game industry hit it big in the 1980s. And during this time, it was very much targeted as the latest toy targeted at boys and young men. At this time, you had a lot of big companies, these big developers and these big console creators competing about who would become the next big thing, who would be the console that was connected to every single TV around the world. And again, a lot of their targeting was specifically at boys and it was the coolest, newest toy. The 90s roll in and with the 90s, we also saw the arrival of the computer. We saw the arrival of the computer in the household. Now, obviously, this had a big impact on the way that obviously the games were being developed. We saw games being published there as well, but I would say the 90s had the biggest impact on the developer side of things because it was much, much easier to release on a computer with a coding language you know than it is for those catered console uh, audiences. So um, we did see a lot more people with some basic programming knowledge and a passion in gaming pushing out their own games during this time. And honestly, I would say this is something that has stuck around even to this day, because even now, if you want to push out a new game, you're an indie studio, it's your first title, you will oftentimes start on the computers before you go on to the console demographic. The 2000s roll in, and with this, we also saw a shift in the demographic because those 80s kids had now grown up. And many of them still wanted to play video games. And some even took their passion into the development scene themselves and wanted to develop their own games. But oftentimes they also wanted to develop games they themselves wanted to play. So we did see a shift from kids over more into teenagers and young adults. You saw this in the form of violence. You saw this in the form of more mature themes. But overall, there was definitely a shift happening in terms of what kind of games were being made. Finally. The 2010 rolls in, and it I would say had two big impacts on the industry. For starters, this hardcore gaming part of it, now we're talking console games and computer games, was a bit hard to ignore anymore, even if you weren't a gamer yourself. You saw billboards out on the streets. Suddenly you had Super Bowl ads for these computer games. 
you saw the arrival of YouTube, of Twitch and all of these and how the influencer scene was dominated by gamers. And you saw the rise of esports, these massive, massive tournaments where you had players competing against players to try and win these multi million dollar rewards. But I would say the biggest impact on the 2010s was the rise of the casual gamer because we saw the arrival of smartphones. And with this, we also saw the arrival of gaming apps. Now you saw your candy crushes, your angry birds, and these were, these were catering to a slightly different kind of player because these people didn't necessarily own consoles or own computers, but they still wanted to entertain themselves, maybe on the commute to work, maybe between classes, maybe it was someone who was retired that was just looking to do something in their spare time. But we saw definitely a broadening of the demographic, but we also saw a massive increase in how many people were actually playing games. Now, before I go back to that first question I asked, I want to be cheeky enough to ask another question of you. And that question is as follows. In 2020, the revenue for the music industry was $20 billion. And for the movie industry, it was $42 billion. How high was it for the video game industry? Again, take a second or two to consider your answers. But I'm not going to hold you for long, at least for that first answer. And I'll make sure to come back to this one much faster than I did the first one. So let's go back. How large a percentage of the world population played video games in 2020? Now, before I reveal the answer, I am quite curious to see where you thought we landed. 35% the majority of you. Good guess. Good guess. Some definitely a little bit on the generous side, others maybe a little too cautious. The answer is in fact 35%. So well done. This is around 2.8 billion people around the world. It's a staggering number. And again, this is both mobile, console, and computers. Now, that second question. Some of you may have suspected. I'm curious to see where he answered. Oh, well, it looks like the answer in one way has already been given just through the poll suggestions. The video game industry is in fact the largest entertainment industry in the world. Now I will say you were a little bit generous maybe, but the answer is 147 billion US dollars. And again, you compare that to movies and music during that time and that is double the size of both of them combined. So it is a very, very fun industry to work in, I must say myself, but this is the world. What about Sweden? What are those numbers like? The numbers I have are from 2019, but they should still give a pretty good representation of how the industry looks like. We have around 435 companies working in Sweden. They employ a little over 9.1 thousand employees. And in 2019, they had a revenue of 24.5 billion Swedish crowns. Now, the interesting thing about all these numbers is they've either doubled or tripled in size compared to just five years previously. So it's very, very clear that it's growing and it's growing a lot. But why is Sweden particularly good? Because Sweden is really one of those countries that is quite leading when it comes to video games. And honestly, there is no one unifying consensus. There are definitely people that have come up with their own suggestions. These are also some of my own personal suggestions. So please do take it with a pinch of salt. But entrepreneurship, we are quite good with that in Sweden. It is quite easy to start a company here. In fact, I co-own a brewery together with my husband and friends. We started this five years back, super easy to start considering especially that we were brewing in our kitchen previously. So it is very, very easy to start a company here. And it is definitely, and it's definitely applicable for the uh, video game industry as well. On top of that, we are one of the leading countries when it comes to innovation. We are very good at spotting things that people might need or thinking a little bit outside the box. I mean, just in tech, we've seen Spotify, we've seen Skype and definitely applies for games as well. In terms of the areas specifically tied to gaming, well, we are known for quality, we are known for creativity, and we're known for skilled business. If you want an example just of a successful Swede within video games, you look no further than Notch, the founder and creator of Minecraft. But it's not all sunshine and happiness in this industry, and we do face challenges both nationally and internationally. For starters, this is an incredibly competitive industry. 
If you look at just Steam, which is the one of the primary digital sale platforms on computers, they released 10,000 new games just in 2020. If you look at Google Play, you will see that there are over 477,000 gaming apps to choose from. So there's definitely a high uh, competition when it comes to getting your product out there, but that also applies to your talent and your competence. There is a high circulation of developers between the different studios, and it is hard to keep your competence in place. So a lot of it's coming both from national, we're of course reaching out to schools as well and trying to get that competence in place, but we are also reaching out internationally. And if you look at, for example, Avalanche Studios Group, I think it's a solid 20 plus percent that is international. Another area of course is capital. It takes quite a while to push out a new game. This is obviously different if you're in mobile versus in the more hardcore space, but we're talking years. So getting that initial capital in place, especially if you're a startup, but even if you're established, is quite important. And last but not least, we're a young industry, which means that even now the rest of the world is kind of catching up to us when it comes to rules and to laws. So we need to constantly be agile. This applies both to the way that we develop our games and consider our timelines, but this also applies to keeping an eye externally, because suddenly a new rule might come in or a new law that has us needing to communicate in a specific way if we want to sell our game. And that is it, a short rundown of how the video game industry looks today. So I'm going to hand over to my co-guest Linda Leto and let her introduce herself. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for that. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm uh, Linda. I am um, graduated uh, SSC in 2020. So I have a bachelor in business and economics and also a master in business and management along with uh, SEMS. So I'm currently working as an account executive at Amazon Web Services, which is uh, the cloud business part of Amazon. Uh, and I'm a part of a team that works with our gaming uh, customers and I focus specifically on the Nordics. So I'm based in Madrid in, in, in Spain nowadays. And uh, today I'm focusing on my own experience and, and my career story and I'm not uh, re representing Amazon Web Services in terms of this, but it's just my own opinions. So uh, to give you a bit of context, um, AWS is a, a global provider of, of cloud services. So we help game studios to uh, provision the core building blocks of their infrastructure and to build their games faster and to also scale them. So like with cloud, you basically enable studios to, to move quicker in response to like player feedback and, and also changing demand. Um, and actually like 90% of, of the world's biggest public um, game companies are, are, using, uh, are using AWS as well. So, so we do work with the whole ecosystem. Uh, so both like creators, developers, publishers, and, and studios with everything from like AAA, huge studios to also like independent ones. Um, and um, so during my time at SSE, I, I did uh, internships within business development and market expansion uh, in, in startups within a variety of industries, such as digital health and entertainment and HR tech and mobility, as, as well as Google. And, uh, and so like this kind of background in tech then also uh, brought me to to uh, Amazon Web Services. So myself, I'm just uh, a casual gamer and I had no like previous background in the gaming industry. But when I joined um, AWS a year ago, I got the opportunity to also like work with our gaming customers from, from the beginning. So I, I found this industry really, really fascinating and it's, it's very, very dynamic as well. And I, I was just very curious about it. Um, and my, my impression is also that like gaming companies are at the cutting edge of tech uh, and innovate a lot. And that's, that was also where I, where I wanted to be. So yeah, so I'm really, you know, enjoying speaking to, to game developers all, all day about, about their games. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, Anna, I believe it is your turn to introduce yourself. Hi everybody, my name is Anna Norvik and I'm the CEO of the game studio Antler Interactive here in Stockholm. I studied at the SSC between 2010 to 2013. It was a bachelor with a specialization in finance and management. And I studied one of the specializations in, in Singapore at the National University of Singapore during 2012. And um, uh, my background to get into games uh, was actually starting from SSE because 
um, well, going even further back, I always had a dream since I was 14 to, to lead a games company. And uh, I played a lot of games back then and, and still do play games. And uh, when I was at my last year at SSE in uh, 2013, there was a, a games person there called Fredrik Wester, who was the, the CEO of um, Paradox Interactive. And uh, it was the first time that a games person was there between all the banks and the management consultants that are usually having lunch lectures. But he was there to lecture about his entrepreneurial journey. And I listened to that. And uh, even though I originally had a plan in going into consulting for a few years before um, pursuing my, my games dream, I, I still ran up to him after the lecture, told him uh, my dream was to work in games. And um, yeah, I, I, he gave me his business card and I added him on LinkedIn. And then half a year later, when I was in China studying Mandarin, he reached out and said there were uh, two positions at Paradox, which might be suitable for me. And uh, then and there I decided that um, I, I might skip the, the other plan and go to games directly instead. And um, I started in games then in January 2014. Uh, first, I worked as a CEO assistant the first year, uh, working a lot of closely with management and structures uh, that they had. And uh, the year after, I realized that I wanted to get closer to the actual making of the games, uh, since I was a curious gamer and um, really wondered how it actually worked. So I I went over to the side of Paradox, which is not the publishing part, but the studio part. Uh, which a lot of companies are divided into, um, and uh, started working uh, closer to the games uh, first as a how to say, coordinator between the publishing and studio part, and then later as a team lead for, I think it was seven expansions, uh, so expansions to existing projects. So, for example, to the game called Crusader Kings 2, uh, we released uh, several expansions, like, um, so additions to that game and my last year at paradox i was the project lead for our biggest project at the time which is called crusader kings 3 which was released last year in september um and uh, which has gone pretty well and uh, as i mentioned why why i am in games it's because uh, i loved games from the start and uh, everything i've done since i was 14 i have gone in that direction actually to <laughs> just both study uh, the, the business side, but also the technical side to understand. So I went one year actually at uh, KDH as well after I had started Handels to, to keep into that technical knowledge. Um, yeah, and now I'm at Antler Interactive as a CEO. I got recruited in 2018 in August. And uh, we do high quality games with support of new technology. So the, the company started as a VR company in 2016, before my time, and um, then transitioned into mobile augmented reality. And um, that's what we worked on when I came into the company. And after that, a lot of things have happened, but we got acquired by a blockchain company in end of 2019. Um, after having released one title that had two blockchain integrations. It was a racing game, a uh, multiplayer racing game. And after that, we figured out what we could do on the blockchain as we partnered up with our mother company to see what exciting things could be done. And we decided to create a project called My Neighbor Alice and uh, released a, a token uh, for that game called the Alice Token. And uh, uh, yeah, it was in the news and things. So that's what my studio is mostly known for right now, the, the Alice project. And we're also working in one project in addition to that. So yeah, that's a bit about myself and the studio. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, introductions are out of the way. Let's uh, move over into the discussion and let's start with trends. So there are a lot of trends obviously going on within the video game industry. It's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing, and thankfully it's constantly growing. So just as 
to set us off a little bit. So one of the trends that we've seen and that I mentioned, for example, is the split between the male and female group. A lot of people, again, still think it's mostly male dominated, but it's gone much closer to a 50-50 split than it has before. On top of that, because of this more diversifying group of gamers, we've also seen this reflected in games itself. You have a lot more diversity when it comes to, you know, what kind of a character you're playing with or interacting with. We've also seen much more consciousness around things like colorblindness, like limited motor capabilities, and making sure that people have access to games, even if they are somehow unable to enjoy it fully. But again, these are just some of the trends that we've seen. So Anna, I'm very curious to hear what some of the trends that you have reacted to that you want to share with us. Yes, yeah, so one of the trends that I think is interesting is the Hollywoodification of the games industry, where films and uh, the Hollywood industry starts to melt together with the games industry. In the sense, for example, with um, a game called Cyberpunk 2077, uh, released yet last year, uh, we had Keanu Reeves playing the main character in that game, uh, which is... Uh, uh, pretty unique, uh, but I think it's just the beginning of, of what we're seeing. We have seen a few other examples as well, and we had one game called Death Stranding, uh, which also had a famous actor, and now we're starting to see uh, also that games really start to look like reality in some cases. Uh, for example, yesterday we saw the, the um, new trailer of Battlefield 2042 getting released. Looks... Uh, no, very close to reality. And I think, yeah, this, this, this is soon going to be hard to tell a movie away from a game. Uh, but I know the big difference is, of course, the interaction uh, which we have in games. And uh, if we look at, for example, uh, what Black Mirror did with uh, Bandersnatch, which was an episode they released, it was interactive. So they went from the movie or serious side of things to get into the interactive part, which I find super interesting. Like where, where is this gonna end? Or are we just all gonna be together in the end? And I think that also games are going into, perhaps looking into more opportunities that might be even more similar to movies in some cases. Um, so that's an interesting trend. And I also find that the professionalism or professionalization of eSport is also something that's happening in the recent years. They get uh, a lot of uh, teams in eSport, get a lot of money. Uh, the biggest uh, competition in the world with the most prize money, the international, it, it's, it is, gives out millions of dollars uh, to the winning teams and, uh, and therefore well, it also attracts a lot of big company who want to sponsor those teams who, uh, yeah, who will benefit from this. And, uh, you know, a lot of young people are watching this right now. So it's, it's not strange that companies want to invest and be seen by all these gamers around the world right now. And um, so if I can just go on with trends, I, I also want to mention the, the mobile trend here. I mean, we've seen a lot of games on mobile and mobile in itself is not really a, a, a new trend or recent trend, but I do see that the games on mobile uh, are changing or at least there are new types of games coming to mobile. So I'm not sure if you've heard about the game Genshin Impact uh, released last year. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's the most, yeah, it was the biggest game in terms of revenue for that year. It was developed in China uh, it's a lot of Chinese people and Americans who play this game. So basically, anyone can play it, um, but it's the kind of game that previously you would have expected it to, to only be on PC and console, but now it's also coming to mobile. And, and the hardware companies like Samsung, uh, from what I've heard, they are also investing a lot in making the hardware better for games so that it's, it's going to be easier to play games without the phone getting hot and the, the lagging in the phones. So that will change the playing field for mobile games, I think. And it's a very interesting uh, arena to look at. And we have also seen some, some other games going to mobile, like PUBG, uh, also a game that I, was hard to imagine like 10 years ago on mobile. But now you can you know, play really realistic, uh, high performance games. 
there is also another game I want to mention called Sky Children of the Light, which is this kind of emotional experience also on mobile. Um, but maybe we don't need to talk about mobile really, but rather like cross-platform that a lot of bigger game companies can afford now. They want to be everywhere that, where the gamer wants to be. Uh, so the, the gamer doesn't have to choose console or platform anymore. Instead, you can just uh, take the platform of your choice. Um, yeah, I can start with those. Those are some very good examples. And honestly, you can even see it with things like uh, Switch, for example, that has kind of, it's a console that released not that very long ago that also has a kind of portable option. So it's very clear that companies are becoming much more conscious of the whole kind of, people aren't always going to be sitting in front of their TVs and their computers. So where else can we meet them? And again, people have 15 minutes to spare on their commute to work, then maybe phones is the way to go. Uh, Linda, what about you? What are some of the trends that uh, you are especially interested in? Yeah, and I, I think uh, the discussion that we had so far was, was really interesting because I, I do think that also during the past year, like COVID has actually impacted uh, has impacted these trends. Uh, but so in, in, in my, uh, and also from my experience, and COVID really then also like accelerated this digital transformation within gaming uh, so that it did become like a disruptive force when it comes to like studios ways of, of working and um, and in terms of like not working from um, uh, from the studio anymore but uh, trying to figure out ways of like being creative from home and and this has cer certainly also um, affected the way that players uh, like engage with them. Um, uh, when they when they play games, so that these are, are are definitely things that um that uh have been you know disrupted this year and and this is most probably a development that uh, that will also continue. That is a very fair point. COVID has been an interesting and strange year, I think, for all of us, or two years. I mean, to be fair, uh, the video game industry has benefited quite a fair bit. We saw a lot of growth, but it came with a lot of challenges. While we're still on trends, I do have a question, Anna, for you specifically, and this one is a little bit more financial in nature. Uh, we've seen the rise of stock prices and we've seen the rise of video games on the stock market. Uh, just throw out a couple of numbers. Those 435 Swedish companies that I mentioned, 13 of those are actually on the stock market. 10 of those have been on the stock market for the last five years. What do you think has triggered this change? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of companies have seen that the, the stock market is, is a, a good way for accessing uh, capital. And there have been a lot of successes uh, for games companies on the stock market. In Sweden, for example, we've had, we've had Steelfront, we've had the, what was called previously THQ and now called Embracer Group. Uh, we have Paradox um, and uh, there are... Yeah, several new game companies also wanting to list. And I think um, one thing that have led to the, the strong rise of the stock prices, especially for Steelfront and Embracer, have been that the consolidation of the industry. So big players acquiring smaller players, smaller players that, that have good numbers um, or have a strong IP. So in, in games, we often talk about in IPs being intellectual properties. So the brands of the games, that uh, is a, a strong uh, value driver in games. And uh, if you have the right IP, uh, you can create, a, a, usually you get the fan base or a community for free. So, um, that is something from what I understand that Embracer has uh, focused a lot on getting companies, acquiring companies that have those good IPs and good communities um, that they can continue to create good game experiences for. Um, so I think that's really interesting and, uh, and that it seems like a, a, a company on the stock market uh, is more worth or valid to a higher uh, number than a company outside of the stock market and uh, might also be that the people now investing they they might have in a higher degree um, been used to games themselves played games themselves when they grew up they think it's a fun industry to put their money into and uh, willing to invest in it and we know the value behind games um, so uh, yeah that's those are my thoughts there uh, spontaneously Thank you, Anna. 
Those are some very good thoughts, if I do say so myself. Um, we've talked a lot about trends. We've talked a lot about the current state, and we've even looked a little bit back into the history of the video game industry. Uh, but I feel it's time for us to maybe put our gazes a little bit towards the future, because, again, they're easily identifiable kernels in the industry itself that we feel might kick off and become something big. Before I, however, kick off the discussion section, I do also want to point this out more for the benefit of all three of us, and that is that the video game industry is very secretive in nature, and as a result, we usually have a lot of NDAs involved. We usually don't communicate. We have a lot of code names, so people can't figure out <laughs> what games we're developing. And also, as a result, a lot of the opinions that you're hearing now during the discussion segment are also mostly our own and definitely not a representation of our companies. But with that said, Anna, why don't we go back to you again? What do you think are some of the things that the future will hold for video game industries, especially since you are part of the kind of AR or augmented reality is also known as an VR or virtual reality part of the industry? Yeah, I feel like we've worked at Under Interactive with the all the hyped, uh, hyped tech that have recently been uh, like a lot of talk about. So. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we, we started in virtual reality as a company uh, in the middle of the VR hype in 2016. Uh, whereas uh, you, you might all know that expectations that were in the middle of this hype, they never turned into reality that it would be a mainstream product in every man's home. So, so instead what VR is, is right now, um, it's, uh, I mean, it still is a, an amazing experience. And if, if you haven't tried it, I definitely recommend to do that. Uh, a lot of, there is a lot of passion around it. There have been a lot of money invested into it. And I think we're still waiting for um, better and easier hardware and maybe an integration with aug what augmented reality also can give. So difference between VR and AR is, then that VR completely um, cuts out the reality, whereas augmented reality, you mix the reality with uh, digital elements. So I think, for example, if we're gonna have glasses or something that it's gonna be both possibilities. But I think, do think that in near term, we will see interesting augmented reality um, applications. Well, not only in, in games, but also outside of games. And uh, you, you can do a lot mixing uh, reality and uh, virtual reality. So I definitely think that there will happen things there. I would not say that it will be mainstream in everyone's home in the, in the next one or two years. I think, you know, there, there have to be also some, I think, business uh, work around how to get those consoles or uh, platforms out. For example, will they be packaged with TVs or computers or laptops in the future? And so that people can easily you know, add on the VR headset. Uh, for example, what PlayStation have done is pretty smart that it can come with your PlayStation set. Um, so that I think is what's gonna happen. And I think we're gonna see, we're gonna see amazing things in, VR as well, maybe more social experiences as well. And uh, of course, I want to mention blockchain uh, since that's what we are focusing right now. Uh, but there really is a lot of interesting things you can do with blockchain. So not only can you fund, uh, fund new games and projects in new ways by, for example, um, releasing your token, um, but you can also give a new type of control to your players, your community, which might sound scary to a lot of game developers or game uh, publishers. Uh, but I think it, in some senses, it might be inevitably uh, to, to give that control to your gamers to own what they have in the game. So in short, what you can do with blockchain for your gamers is making them own an asset from the game and letting them trade that asset no matter where. Uh, so instead of you as a game developer controlling that you can only trade this uh, weapon, for example, in your own marketplace, someone can take that asset and trade it in any kind of marketplace, uh, which means that the ownership is more like a physical item rather than um, just connected to the game developer. Uh, what I also think is interesting with blockchain is that you will be able to create new types of partnerships 
so for example, it's possible to quite easily connect to other companies' blockchains uh, because blockchain is by itself transparent and open. So uh, if you want to collaborate with other blockchains, that's pretty easy to bring in their uh, assets in your game and letting others use your assets in their game. Um, so you could potentially build ecosystems around uh, a specific either asset or around the game and uh, letting other games using your token or yeah, using other tokens for your game. So lots of interesting collaborations there I think will be able to happen. Um, but yeah, also I want to mention that the blockchain in, is in itself also a way just to let the player see that things are transparent and, and secure. Uh, if you're going to have a lottery, for example, then you can have it on the blockchain so that people can see it rather than uh, having it as a, as a thing um, hidden behind the game developer and then no one can see it. So um, yeah, lots of... Uh, Lots of applications there, but we're at very, very early still with all of those three AR, VR, and the blockchain. But it, I think, beyond the hype, I think just as with the IT bubble, we will find real applications, real user cases where it makes a lot of sense to use these techs. Maybe not to the sense, to the high extent that the bubbles sometimes uh, seem to say, uh, but. But definitely, there will be user cases, I'm sure, for all of these three technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, Linda, what about you? Do you have any thoughts, your own personal opinions on what, what uh, hardcore and casual gamers alike might expect from the industry in the coming decade sure. or so? Sure, Cecilia. So also previously, um, you mentioned that like there is um, like the whole um, kind of pool of people who are playing playing games nowadays is becoming much more much more diverse and that actually like the majority of people who play games don't even identify themselves as as gamers so that um uh, what i'm i imagine that will also um happen in, in the future is that there will or that we can expect that there will be uh you know there will uh, appear more games targeting specific specific audiences catering to uh niche audiences and that this whole um this whole field becomes becomes more diverse in that sense and also since it has grown so much that it uh, gets more more visibility instead of being this uh, only this underdog so uh, that's my my view of uh, maybe how like uh, different types of like sub uh, subcultures and, uh, and and different niches are, are going to grow as well so that everyone finds their own uh, own type of, of game to play be it mobile or PC or console um, so that's that's definitely definitely something that I'm I'm seeing just from like a personal personal point of view and and just how many new different games are, are coming up and uh, and so on so um, that that is that is something that um, uh, that is uh, that is happening from from my perspective. Wonderful. And again, yeah, it is it is constantly shifting. And again, the market is growing. So with that, the target audiences and the tastes do vary as well. And there's a lot of thought that goes into player behavior and a lot of what they seek in in games sitting on the marketing side of things, as I do. I have gotten some insight into that. Um, another thing maybe that is worth also mentioning uh, from my own personal uh, per perspective is also the arrival of and continued popularity of basically the equivalent of streaming services. Now, this applies both for things that are the equivalent of Netflix. Basically, you're playing as paying a subscription amount and you get access to a fixed library of games that is constantly changing and evolving and old games are or even not even old, but certain games get kind of pushed out after a while. But you also do see this, for example, in the form of being able to play pretty high intensive games on a laptop and there are only now we're starting to see kind of like the early stages of this but the technology is trying to figure out also how do we get away a little bit from that kind of entry barrier cost and let players start to play the games without necessarily being kind of weighed down by technology so while we've definitely seen a trend towards that as well i do believe we'll see much more of that in the future as they kind of iron it out 
looking at the time and changing business sorry and also just like changing business models uh so we can probably expect that to happen also in other forms than subscription uh, services most definitely most definitely uh looking at the time uh i think unless anna linda do you have anything else you want to lift up both in terms of trends or in terms of future uh, well, something that I find interesting as well is the rise of creator games like Roblox uh, that is uh, just recently got listed to a huge valuation and lots of young people playing this game. And uh, and uh, of course, you all know know about Minecraft, what its success that has been. And there are also games, um, for example, we have Animal Crossing. Also, this kind of game where you you build your own things. There's not necessarily uh, a specific goal, but more of the the enjoyment and fun in creating experiences for other people or yourself and uh, getting getting your creativity uh, out. So, I think that's gonna be interesting to see how that translates to to games in a few years' time when that uh, audience uh, grows older and uh, how that's gonna change the. The landscape and uh, looking at the uh, speaking of monetization models i mean will there be models where people get then a cut i think that's the case in roblox actually when the, where the creator of a, a mini game in roblox where they get a cut of the revenue coming from that uh, mini game and will will creators of in minecraft then get a cut from selling uh, their huge uh, creations spaceships and stuff that they create in minecraft um yeah, so uh, I want to mention that, and uh, I think gaming is going to continue to be quite social as well, um, since more and more people uh, play games. It's uh, it's uh, going to be a natural thing of a lot of people's lives, where where they do hang out with friends in in another way than when they physically meet. I think that's definitely a valid point, and again, having my own experiences as well, working with these kinds of IPs that didn't usually kind of present themselves in games. I've worked with what's called the Warhammer IP, these kind of tabletop little action figures that is a strategy game and worked with their creator games workshop. And it's the same thing there as well, just kind of mixing and matching and suddenly you see characters you might have in their sortiments and you in turn make sure that the equivalent is available in the game. So it is it is interesting and it's most definitely becoming a social thing as like continue to be a social point, especially now during COVID. When you can't meet physically, you can still meet in game like you always have. Looking at the time, we have, I would say it might be good to start slowly transitioning over into the Q&A. Again, unless Linda, Anna, anything else to add? I do have seen some questions trickling in on the side, so I figure it might be time to start looking into those a little more. Yeah, we can go ahead with the questions. Let's start with the questions then. Um, we did have a couple of questions sent in before this that I will start, but we will definitely have a look at those that have come in now as well. Um, one of the ones that I think I partially addressed, but might as well be worth kind of going into a little more, not detail, but answer a little bit more fully is, what is the user penetration rate when it comes to gender and age groups? So I said that it was much closer to 50-50 split. Uh, it is around, again, these are more towards the US. There isn't a whole encompassing international uh, like data on this, but it is 41 to 59 female to male. And in certain uh, genres, it's definitely bigger, while in others, like I think Dota, it's and those kinds of uh, MOBAs, uh, they are very, very, very male centric. Uh, in terms of age, again, this is more towards the, the uh, US demographic, but we have around the, 38%, so the biggest group in the 18 to 35 age bracket. After that, you have 26 in the 35 to 54, and the third is 21% in 18 or younger. So it's much more diverse and it's older. I want to say, I read some statistics that said the average age is around 35 now. Um, how about, how do I as a student break into gaming as a career? I think we all have some interesting perspectives to provide on this, but Anna, Linda, maybe one of you start. Yeah, I think one thing that I want to send with people wondering about this is uh, that one one way to start is to start networking. I mean, uh, maybe easy to say since that's how I got into games by meeting Frederick at that uh, at that point in time at SSE. Uh, but really, keep your eyes open. I bet there are more game companies coming to SSE nowadays. Um, so networking or contacting people at LinkedIn and just uh, 
um, talking with them to get to know games and how people get in. I think that's a good way. Then they can keep you in mind whenever there is a role that might fit you. Yeah, and my impression is also that, I mean, since gaming companies are in the end also companies they need to run as a business, you will also like always need uh, the business skills that we get from SSC, be it like marketing or or something around like business strategy so that maybe you can also think quite broadly around like what specifically you would like to do because I think there is space for like many different types of talent or even like within finance um, because yeah, you can create uh, amazing games but then if you're not able to somehow maybe monetize some of them or like figure out the right way to market them uh, that's also a part of part of the challenge so like thinking around uh, maybe that perspective and, and thinking about yeah diff different different approaches to it and, and if you're interested in working for a studio or more from the tech side uh, as I am because like what we're doing is to provide the technology like for for the games or is it uh, to work with a publisher or 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 which which part you find interesting actually. Um, yeah, and from my my side as a marketeer like. The, you do need to have at least a little bit of a kind of passion for this, if I'm going to be honest, at least on the marketing side of things, because you're so consumer facing. Uh, but I mean, on the financial side of things as well, this doesn't necessarily have to be a given, but the closer you get to the, uh, the end product, I think the more that passion needs to be in place, uh, just to kind of understand also the, the demographic, because it is a very different kind of industry, all things considered. We're all unique in our own special ways, but it is very... Uh, very different. Um, I think I saw a question here that I can actually continue on on that note because the question was, uh, could you tell us uh, something about marketing in the gaming industry for a non-gamer strategies, buzz, budgets, channel, etc. I think this kind of applies a little bit to that because at the end of the day, uh, releasing a game is very much like releasing a movie. Uh, you end up kind of figuring out what's unique about your game. We call it our player promise, basically. It's like, what, what would be the thing that defines your game? Uh, and we need to kind of look at the market as well, look at the market space, where are our competitors, uh, what niches do they, what kind of, both niches, but also like what kind of player behaviors kind of do they scratch, like which itches do they scratch and how do we differentiate ourselves from that? Uh, on top of that, we also need to figure out our announcement periods. We need to figure out how we get as big a splash as possible, communicate it out to media, communicate it out to, you know, social channels and build up that kind of core community. Uh, but also just kind of figure out where in this landscape of releases and news and everything that kind of happens in the video game industry is a good point to blow your little trumpet and kind of announce what you're making. After that, honestly, it's a combination of finding appropriate partners. It can be, again, media. It can be with influencers where you either pay them or you organically give them a key and let them try out the game. Uh, and then slowly but steadily building up that hype, different campaigns of different lengths. Sometimes you announce it two years in advance to slowly, steadily build up interest. Other times you basically announce it just a few months before you release. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about keeping that interest, figuring out which beats you want to kind of catch everyone's attention on again, and then finding a good release window where again, you have a chance to shine without necessarily having to kind of compete with the elbow room. But there will never be a week where nothing isn't completely happening. Again, 10,000 computer games released in 2020. So it is hard to find a window. <laughs> And I would also like to add a comment because I saw the, the next um, uh, question about also on the mobile side and since we have yes. been working a lot with mobile. Um, my, my view is that uh, marketing on the mobile side is uh, it's quite special in the games industry. A lot of publishers we talk with, they, they say either like they are focused on PC and console or they are focused on mobile because the... I would say primarily that the marketing strategies are quite different in the user acquisition and and mobile it's it's very quick the exciting about it um what you can do with it is that it's very quick and you can test things hopefully you don't hear my cat in the background now uh, you can test things in in a very entrepreneurial way getting responses quickly just by paying for your users and clicks to to see what you've done you can try like new concepts and see how many clicks it gets um, you can also run a lot of A-B tests and uh, see which version of this. I mean, you can do that for, for a normal game project too, but in uh, mobile, you can usually get the small prototype ready uh, in 
perhaps just a few weeks in some cases, depending on what you want to achieve. Um, and uh, trying out just, you know, the, the UX design of the game uh, for players and for smaller amounts of money than actually investing in a big PC production. Because in PC productions, it's more that you start to see how fun it is at the middle or the near the end of the production but in mobile it's it's very quick iterations and entrepreneurial yeah that's actually again very valid point i've barely sat with mobile myself but it is a very very different kind of marketing altogether from what we do on the more kind of the, again the hardcore the the console the the computer games um, one of the questions that we had both from earlier that kind of overlapped with one of the questions that came in was how will increased competition affect the industry in what way uh, can incumbents protect themselves from new competition? And alongside that, we had specific examples here in what way has the increasing uh, success of indie developers? So example, Coffee Stain and Toby Fox challenged the business models of established studios. Anna Linda, either of you want to kick this off or should I take the reins? Yeah, you can you can go ahead. <laughs> so uh, again, marketing perspective, you need to look at your pr player promise. Usually that player promise is quite established regardless of your competition. You need to be mindful of who you're competing against, both big and both small. So usually you have different tools. And even with the rise of indie developers, I don't think that space is ever going to be gone. It's like saying these two big new authors have hit the scene. How will they impact you reading some of your favorite genres? Not really at the end of the day. A gamer is consumer of entertainment. The only question really is, is time and kind of attracting them in some way. And it might again be that you have a very unique aspect to your player promise that combines different things in a unique way that maybe some of your competitors might not do. It might be something as simple as you're, you are just competing on price. So you end up going much, much lower than your competitors. And in that case, people just looking to have something fun to do for a short period of time can jump in and buy it. Or again, as we pointed out as well, you have niche industries where the competitive landscape is considerably different. In the case of Avalanche Studios and one of their uh, sister companies, uh, Expansive Worlds, they have released a massive hunting game called The Hunter Call of the Wild, which has become incredibly successful and it has become incredibly successful because it's competing in a part of the video game genre there we don't really have a lot of other big uh, players so people that are looking for a nice hunting experience or in the case of this game just walking out in nature in front of the comfort of your you know computer screen or tv they purchase the game as a result of that so i would say while you're definitely aware of these success stories like coffee stain toby fox etc they're more a kind of another aspect to consider in the grand scheme of things rather than something that is a massive competition that now completely, you know, blows up the market. We might have time for maybe one more question. I don't yeah, I see, I, I don't see some interesting questions here in the chat. So uh, many gamers don't like uh, pay to win aspects in the game. Do you think it can be damaging for a product with still a good strategy if you do it right? And my spontaneous thought here is it's, uh, it's, it might be two different uh, target groups, uh, the gamers who, who are okay with it and there are lots who are not okay. And I know a lot of game developers uh, like ourselves, like my, my studio, we are um, quite aware of this and trying to avoid uh, pay to win elements rather making uh, what you pay for doesn't, um, doesn't give you that advantage, uh, but rather, you know, cosmetics or, or other things in the game that, uh, that affect your experience, but still not uh, competitive elements. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I can only agree with that front, like same on the computer and the, the console side of things, while we naturally are aware of this. And if we're going to be honest, even this kind of the, those, the dreaded term, the microtransaction equivalent was, you know, five, 10 years ago was just a no, don't go there. Everyone very, very clearly dislikes it. It was the same with early access early on. But as we changed and as you've started to see developers implement this in a smart fashion, you also notice the kind of immediate kind of shrugging away from it to, to disappear 
But I think a big part of that has, just to Anna's point, has to do with the fact that we've gone away from things that have a really big impact on the way you consume the game and more into things like cosmetics or other things that are slightly on a more, you know, I, I do it because I want to have it because I want to, you know, have my character look pretty or do a specific thing. But it's very rarely something that's going to fundamentally change your gaming experience. And for the last uh, question in the chat, how do you see the challenges facing companies that have an acquisition strategy for growth? How important is corporate culture in running a studio? Um, I have thought around this topic, uh, what's, what's going to happen to those uh, companies on the stock exchange with that uh, strategy? And uh, I mean, eventually with, with this hard competition and more and more companies doing this, and maybe eventually there will be as SPACs as well, like those kind of companies on the stock exchange that are only there to acquire um, companies. Uh, I haven't seen any in the games yet, but maybe it's just a question of time. Um, yeah, there will be a very hard competition to, to acquire those smaller game companies that are profitable or so. So I think uh, then you have to go to even... Uh, other measures and uh, earlier measures of how the game success is going to be. And it's really, really hard when you come to a certain stage to determine if a game is going to be successful or not, um, which uh, is going to be interesting to see how it turns out. I wish I uh, knew what the companies are going to do, if they're going to acquire like bigger other acquisition players, or are they going to look into other fields um, such as going more close to the film or music or industry it's it's hard to see exactly like what about obvious strategy they would go for but uh, definitely there will be a lot of competition for uh, the smaller companies and how important is corporate culture in running a studio i i'm not i'm not sure here if that question is related to those acquisition growth companies because uh, yeah i wonder too how it's what happens when a, a studio gets acquired and those culture have to merge somehow but from what i understand so quite successful strategy here is to let the studio keep running on their own and mostly try to put together the things that are uh, above the studio's culture and help with those things that they want help with rather than uh, trying to force a culture on top of them. So, and I think they do their due diligence uh, before they buy to make sure that the culture is not uh, outside what they want to stand for, uh, which would make sense. But maybe that's something as well that would lead to uh, you would get a, uh, you would look broader than culture eventually when you need to because of fierce competition. Um, we will see. So um, looking at the time, we are unfortunately running out of time, but uh, hopefully Anna, Linda, myself were, was able to at least provide a little bit of an insight, a little bit of an introduction to the video game industry. If we had our way, we could sit here for hours and hours and hours and just talk about video games, but unfortunately we don't have that time. So thank you very much from me and my co-guests. And Anna, let me hand it back to you, specifically Anna Monson. Yeah, lots of lots of Annas here uh, tonight. But thank you so much to you all, Cecilia, Linda, Anna, for educating us on this very interesting topic and sharing your insights. And thanks to all of you for attending. I hope that you found it as interesting as I did. At the alumni office, we're now busy planning events for the fall, and we will update the website with information about this continuously. But in the meantime, you can always check out the recordings from previous webinars in our video library on the website. So please uh, do that. And also please keep an eye out for the event evaluation survey that we will send out shortly after this webinar together with the recording. We would really, really appreciate your feedback. Have a lovely evening and I hope to see you online soon again. Thanks, bye.